welcome to Sabbath school this morning. We're kind of, we're a few, but maybe a few more will come later. Um, and one, of you, one of you guys, would you like to look up James 3.16 and read verse 16 through 18? Oh, I forgot, you know, I'm sorry. Let's bow, let me bow my heads for a word of prayer and let me open Sabbath school with prayer. And Robert, would you mind opening our Sabbath school? Lord, we thank you for the Sabbath day, and we thank you for the ability to come meet together and study your word, for we know there are many people in the world that don't have this opportunity. So we ask you to send your spirit to bless our study that, um, that we could gain a better insight into you than anyone watching may also. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah, if, if one of you has that, James 3, 16 through 18, if you'd read that. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. What about 17 and 18? Okay. <laughs> okay, well, let me. But, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, yeah. without hypocrisy. Verse 18, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Yeah, thanks. What a... What do, what do jealous people want? Did you think about that? I mean, it talked about um, my Good News Bible actually said jealousy and selfishness. What, what do jealous people want? Well, the problem with a lot of jealousy, it's irrational. It never actually shows that anything will come to fruition. If I'm jealous that someone's talking to somebody else and I think it might affect my relationship with them, it doesn't mean it does. It means that I have a problem, they don't. So um, and I think that's why the next phrase that says what happens when these things exist, jealousy causes disorder. And the next one, selfish ambition, which is, that's more of the envy and all that kind of stuff that we were talking about earlier. That's where you get every vile practice because people will go to no ends to get what they want if they have no moral, you know, compass. Yeah. Yeah. I think, Harry, jealousness, um, I think, calls attention to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It just, it's, it's for you. You know, if you're jealous, you, you know, it's kind of like Rob said, you know, you, someone is, uh, is taking up time that you think ought to be taken up by you. What, what about selfishness? How, do, how does jealousy fit in with selfishness? I think it is selfishness. I, it, I was, it's an emotional form of selfishness. Yeah, I, I was thinking it's a subset yeah. of selfishness. Would you yeah. agree with that? Yeah. 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 Okay, what about, what about envy? We were talking a little bit about this before the lesson started. Uh, and I wonder how that... Well, uh, en go en ahead. envy uh, is covetousness. Yeah. Well, Period. That, 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 that's, that's what it is. It's just a synonym for it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're, that's one of the Ten Commandments. It, you know, oh, it, so leads to, it leads to death and destruction. Period. I mean, yeah. isn't that what Cain and Abel or Cain's heart most likely became? And he rose up against his brother. It was envy for God accepting the sacrifice of Abel and him not accepting the sacrifice of Cain. And then, of course, that little bit of uh, Abel tried to, you know, help him out, and uh, th th that produced some ill will, too. But mm -hmm. I think yeah. envy's where it started. Yeah. Uh, can I say something here? Sure, sure. I just want to read something. It says, selfishness is being concerned excessively or exclusively for oneself or one's own advantage. Thanks. Yeah. That, that helps with this. I mean, because... How about this? Would you say that selfishness is um, survival of the fittest, and the fittest is me? <laughs> Could be, Harry. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I kind of think that, you know. And if you if you look at look at dictators, 
one thing that they are consistently is they have an exaggerated sense of self. Yeah, right. I mean, it's, it's like, you might laugh, but I don't know if you ever read Dr. Seuss, Yertle the Turtle. I'm Yertle the Turtle, oh marvelous me, for I am the king of all that I see. On land, on sea, even up in the sky, there's none other that's greater than I. Oh, <laughs> that was from Dr. Seuss. Yeah. 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 It's quite, a, it, it's an interesting story, I tell you, and, and I think it brings out some good points about what yeah. we're talking about this morning. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it goes back to the old phrase, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Um, we see that over and over in the Bible where someone starts out humble, maybe God-fearing and so forth, and they get power. Someone else is looking up to them, right? That's kind of what the definition of power is. And yeah. it goes to their head. They That's become right. selfish, and they forget God and go right off the deep end. I mean, we see that with King Saul. We saw that with Solomon. Why is this man that ever lived? He had a period in his life and could have been quite extensive that self-ruled um, and, it, and fortunately the wisdom finally as he got over overtook that selfishness and he was able to look back on it and say you know that was all foolishness and uh, he was given insight to us that we can then look at and say how temporary and vain all that is. Yeah, and he didn't leave any wiggle room there either. He yeah. said, all is vanity, right? Right, I mean, all he, is vanity. he experienced the pride of life, the wisdom of, uh, uh, given by God, and the, the ambition, the, the adoration, everything that anyone could have ever experienced. Yeah. And fortunately, the wisdom God gave him he was able to, in the end, like I was saying, bring it around, bring it around and write about it to where we can look at it and, uh, and have an example yeah. to show. Yeah. yeah. No matter how great you think you, you're going to be in this yeah. world, it doesn't matter. Yeah. I, I'm warning you. Be careful. Is what he's saying. You know. I'm just telling yeah. you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Have you? Ever, I don't know if you've got, any of you've ever seen the movie Amadeus. You know. Salieri and Mozart, you know, I mean, it, it kind of takes liberties with history somewhat, but what's, what's really interesting and sad is, see, Salieri was the court composer in Austria for the king, and he was a bit older than Mozart, and here Mozart comes along, a child prodigy. Salieri had dedicated his life to God to live just the way God, even more, almost like a monk, you know, yeah. to live the way that God wanted him to, and in return, all he asked was to bless him with musical talent. Yeah. Well, anyway, here comes Mozart, who, child prodigy, and when he gets a little older, he lives like the devil, yeah. you know, dissolute, immoral, and yet his music is so much better than Salieri's. It's, it's, you know, he, Salieri isn't even in the same class. And he can't stand it. And he gets mad at God. And, uh, yeah. But, I mean, there you go, see. Mm -hmm. Why can't I have what this undeserving yeah. person, when I deserve some, to be, have so much more talent than he does well, or she does? Yeah, and furthermore, uh, when you think about it, this is interesting, Harry, because especially for a person who has served all their lives humbly, yeah. okay, you, uh, you know, that hit pretty hard. And yet, there was John the Baptist, you know, his cousin. I'm not even worthy to tie his sandals, you know. And, yeah. and John himself had uh, quite a bit of a claim, I would think, in those days. Well, you know, I, I think that's why I, when, I, when I think of Jesus, I think of humility. Yeah. Yep. John the Baptist the same way. Yes, yes. I think, I think humility probably after love or maybe it's part of love, maybe you, should, you could say, yeah. you know, is one of the greatest characteristics of a Christian. <laughs> well, you know, looking at the memory text that we were talking about earlier, I, I, I read that, and the images I've seen this week coming out of South Africa come to mind. Ooh, man. Disorder in every vile practice. Yeah. I mean, 
because of jealousy and selfish ambition on both sides, that country right now has just melted down into chaos. Everyone just takes what they want whenever they want. They've looted and destroyed everything in sight. And they think they're justified in it in their own minds. Yeah, yeah. It is sad. You know, I was going to ask you, I think um, jealousy and selfishness, envy, all these things can develop and, or sometimes maybe, maybe bitterness comes first. I don't know. But I, I think sometimes it takes a while for bitterness to develop. I don't know. What do you think? You think so? I think it takes a little bit of time for bitterness usually to bitterness come on. Bitterness isn't instant. Bitterness is, in my opinion, something that grows. Yeah. Yeah, I think so yeah. too, Harry. Yeah. You know, there's a saying that um, if there was no bitterness, there would be no dictators. You ever thought about that? Whoa. Do you believe that? How about that? Huh. You well, the amazing it? thing, well, you look at the history, most dictators came to power through popularity of the people. Very few of them came in just as a military coup and took over. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they had a large portion of the population that wanted them to be in power. Yeah, and those people um, oftentimes were the bitter ones. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Didn't like the way they had been treated or the way things were. Uh, well, you know, what's interesting, uh, Marx, Karl Marx said that before the revolution come the anarchists and the criminals. Yeah. 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 But then yeah. they have to be eliminated so that, because they're the troublemakers. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Once, once they've used them for the, their purpose, then they eliminate them. You're right. Yeah. You know, I mean, think about before the Great Depression, of 60 million people in Germany, there were never more than 100,000 Nazis yeah. out of 60 million. Yeah. It took the Great Depression, yeah. you know, to come before the Nazis got into power. And once Hitler, you know, Hitler was voted into power. Yeah. People, people probably like you and I yeah. Yeah. Vo voted him into power. And well, once he, because he, he promised them economic prosperity. And once, once he got in, you know, he never looked back. Well, and, and part of that, too, is I believe most of the people turned a blind eye to what he was doing because they were actually getting economic prosperity. Things were getting better for the average German in that country at that time. So some didn't even care what he did. Some willingly just didn't want to know. Yeah. Well, you know, my, my mom told me that when she was young, there was a German family that, that worked for her dad on the farm, and they lived in a, in a house on the farm there, and she, she said that the man, she heard him say once, Hitler is my God. Whoa. Go ahead, Tim. Hitler was vegetarian. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. He was vegetarian. Yeah, yeah, he was a bad veggie. <laughs> yeah, and and you know something, something to think about. There's there's, you know, a story going around that's been going around for years, and that's that's that there's a difference between fascists and socialists. That's untrue. S socialists and communists. A communist is a Marx kind of socialist. Marx you, Marx invented the word communist. Because he didn't want people to, he wanted to set him, his people apart from the socialists, the general, general run of the socialists. Fascists, socialists, communists, there's not a hair's breadth of difference between all three of those. You know? I mean, the, the, the main difference between the fascists and the socialists and the communists is that the fascists believe that the government should direct, closely direct how business operates. They don't actually own the business, but they tell them exactly what to do. What's the difference? You know? So it's something to think about. But, I, you know, wouldn't it make sense to believe that there are people in this country who know the history of all these re socialist revolutions from the French Revolution on? 
and they're waiting to apply the same principles today? Well, well that's because they think they can do it better. But there you go. Well, and in fact, Harry, aren't we, aren't we told, uh, doesn't the spirit of prophecy tell us to study the French Revolution for the last days in our history? Isn't that, isn't that right? Yeah. That's, a, that's an awful thing. If, if you read the French Revolution, you wonder how things could hardly be any worse, you know, but does she say that it'll be worse than the French Revolution? Oh, that we should study it, you know. Yeah. Mm. I don't think anything can, probably can be worse than what is, what is coming. I, yeah. we can't imagine, she does say we can't imagine. Our worst imagination can't bring up what is going well, to be like. Well, everything's happened before, just not on the same scale. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it didn't involve the entire world. Kind of like COVID. There's been other diseases, not in our lifetime, but none that didn't. They didn't involve the entire world. They didn't change the the everything, society and people and all this stuff. I mean, it it, it doesn't matter how well, it matters less. The, the the ferocity of the disease itself. It matters more on the way people have responded to it worldwide, and um, it's fascinating. These are these are these are steps. The, the Satan has, has put in place to set up the things that are coming. These aren't the end. This is the steps towards it. Yeah. And, and you know, the thing is, well, you can sure tell he's active, can't you? Can't you see it? And like you were talking about South Africa. Oh, man. Oh, anybody that thinks that that can't happen here, I think, is fooling themselves. Look at Portland. I'm not saying it is going to happen here. I think it, it, is it, it, it may, here. but I'm not saying when. But to say it can't. I think it's foolishness. Because the same. Yeah, go ahead. This is our call. I mean, when we were talking about um, Solomon and him being so self focused, in a desire of age, it says, The soul that is yielded to Christ becomes his own fortress, which he holds in a revolted world. And he intends that no authority shall be known in it except his own. And that's a capital H in Christ's own. A soul. A soul thus kept in possession by the heavenly agencies is impregnable by the assaults of Satan. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Thanks, Tim. Yeah. Let me ask you this. What kind of, what kind of disorder is evil? Because is all disorder evil? Well, I mean, God is a God of order. So it depends on what you're trying to refer at as disorder, but normally disorder kind of goes along with the idea of chaos, to where it's like everything is for itself. Like and South Africa. No, no, yeah, like South Africa. Like Portland. And there's no specific organization to it. It's just everybody does what they want to do. Everything does what it wants to do. And in a disordered system, there, there's individuals are not being part of the group, okay. in a sense, or whatever it is, you know. I like the bigger question going to be faced with now, and you can see it in our the background of our culture, is division God. And there's a lot of folks that will say the revolution, you can look and hear it on YouTube, you can find the Pope talking about it, you can find a lot of evangelical leaders talking about it, that division is not godly. That the revolution of 500 plus years ago, the Protestant revolution, Protestant uh, change was a Satan inspired division of the church and they're wanting us to come back and yield. So I don't think disorder is consistent with God's principles but division is because he calls us to have an exodus from things that aren't based on truth and his law and his love and his character are what it has to be based on and not just on unity itself or on love itself without having the underground foundation of the truth. Yeah. But so, the, the difference, though, is I believe the division's not coming from God. The division comes from those that are against God, but they try to flip it. They try to make it. From it from God. They, he called Moses out of yeah. Egypt. He yeah. called well, Abraham because, out of his family. But because of the wicked sword, yeah. not, not to you. He called people for division in certain circumstances. To yeah. separate, to, yeah, to separate, not to cause strife. Right. Yeah. No, disorder is not really God's principle. I mean, he wrapped yeah. up his and folded his bedcloth yeah. in the tomb. Yeah. Well, so yeah. disorder is not really what is a godly principle, but division is in certain circumstances when he calls us to divide. 
And to get back to that question, Harry, it, you know what? It depends on where you're where you're looking at it from. I think. Yeah. You know, when you look at, you know, <laughs> when you look at Orion, you know, the horse's head nebula. Okay. Uh, is there is there uh, disorder there? What? Huh? Well, see, it's it's not. It's, it's not so bad, see, because when I throw these things out, I hear a lot of things I didn't think about while I was studying the lesson this week, you know. But um, what, I, what I was thinking about was that I think sometimes that weak teachers in a classroom situation where there's a discussion going on are afraid to allow any disorder. Wow. And, and I think that some disorder, as long as it's all, everybody's working towards the same object, you know, or maybe you'd call that unity. I don't. I don't know. But uh, to you, me, Harry. that's not so bad. Just in case, know? we want you to know we're with you. <laughs> okay. But you know, I, I think that the disorder that exploits other people is is one of the biggest. I mean, that that you know that's wrong. Yes. You know, because Christians don't do that kind of thing. Yeah. Um. Well, I mean, and what we call disorder may be just not understanding the big picture look at okay i look at the moon i look at all of the craters all over the moon yeah that means there were meteors asteroids whatever flying through space that thumped into it that would seem like disorder <laughs> yeah yeah that's why i said but it depends i on don't the understand the big picture i yeah. can't see everything spinning in space and the purposes god put in it all yeah. he may have put a purpose for that to smack into that at that time i I'm don't sure. know you know, it would, yeah. it would appear to the ungodly that that's just chaos, and at any moment, you know, this could happen anywhere. Yeah, was that random or controlled chaos? Exa <laughs> exa that, that's my point. Yeah, that's and disorder right. seems like it's random. Yes. And yes. I, think, I think the point I'm making is I don't understand the whole picture. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good point, too. You know, um, something else. How, how does, how, I think a fear plays a big part here. I mean, how, do, how does fear fit in with what we're talking about? Like, so how does fear fit with selfishness? You know, we've talked about this before in class, you know, when we were over there in the um, school. Well, I'd heard a, a thing a, long, a few years ago that, you know, there's basically two or three core emotions or things that drive all behavior. Love is one. Fear is another, and potentially pride is a third. And everything we do is based upon one of those as a core. Fear is the absence of love. So is pride. Love cannot, when it's pure, the other two don't exist either. They're, they're mutually exclusive from each other. Perfect love does what to fear? Drives out fear. Cast it out. That's right. So, so Satan's entire mode of operation is to produce pride or fear in people because that will drive out love. See, but I, I think it's important, though, to talk about what, what, what kind of fear are we talking about here? Because, I mean, am I talking about the fear of a person that's standing on the edge of a high cliff? Does that, is that what causes selfishness? No, that's, no, that's, that's really... That's, that self-preservation, I mean, self you know. That's well, right. fear, almost yeah. all of these are based on our perception of future events, right? We yeah. think something bad will happen in the future, and that produces fear. That's when we true. Have, when we yeah. have trust in God explicitly, we then love him. How, how about, um, but tie something else, go, go a little bit broader with it. Um, how about fear of not being loved? Have you ever known anybody like that? How about fear of not being able to measure up? Everybody gets a sad look on their face. Well, those, <laughs> We've all felt that, they, haven't we? Yeah, well, aren't they, aren't they? Aren't those all real, Harry? Do what now? Aren't those all real fears that people yes. have? Oh, yeah. yeah. But, yeah. And, and they can cause selfishness. I mean, yes. see, that's... But see, that's where Jesus stands up and says, look at my hands. <laughs> I mean, when you look at him, those questions become answered, don't they? I mean, Satan's sitting there trying to say that's real, and, and, and you're absolutely right. You, you don't deserve anything, and nobody's going to love you because of 
what you've done. Jesus doesn't say anything about what you've done. He just, look at me, look what I did for you. But, you know, if, if we give in to these fears, these wrong kind of fears, how does that make us see other people? We think that they're the way we perceive to fear that they will be, whether they are or not. Are, are, are they going to be our friends? No. Yeah. No, see? I mean, we can see them as competitors, yeah, as, a, as, as right. opponents. Right. right. You know? I mean, I mean and they're people to be defeated so that I can get ahead. If we give in to these kind of fears, that, that's why they see these things are so dangerous. I mean, oh man, you know, it boils down to selfishness right there. Doesn't that's it? that's right. Yeah, you know, and you remember what the psychiatrists have told us that the more we do one thing, the more it gets ingrained in our brains, and the more likely we are to do it again. So, know? so in the end, you if you believe that, then and there's a group that's standing in your way, the, the, you got two options. Either get them to conform or eliminate them. That's right. Well, that, that, I'm, saying, I'm saying if you have these beliefs and, 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 and these four things, and, which are delusional, yeah. then when you confront this, you have basically two options. You get them to conform to your ideas or you try to eliminate them. And that's that's the history of uh, a lot of these movements that are based on this emotion. Yeah. We're kind of dancing around the real important part, which is how do we view God? Do we fear him or do we view him as somebody who has our best interest at his heart? And, you know, when he says, I will finish a work that I've begun in you, we have to have confidence that he's there for us. Amen. That's good point, good. Tim. That's good, Tim. <clears throat> you know. How, how should we see others? Shouldn't shouldn't we look on look on them as as family members? Sure. As people that people that have weaknesses. Yeah. Can, <coughs> candidates for the kingdom, Harry, just like us. Candidates for the kingdom, right? I mean, sons and daughters of God, right? Yeah. I mean, we should look at them as as people who have their own fears and insecurities and weaknesses, and empathize and help them. Yeah. Instead of trying to defeat them. Yeah. You know? Right. And, and it's only through God, right. a, a correct view of God, really. Right. Yeah. A correct view of God. It's like Christ washed Judas' feet, right? Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? He knew, but he loved his enemy. And yeah. he demonstrated that to us, and that's the hard one for me to follow. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. What is it that, that heals fear? Like I was saying earlier, the, the love drives it out. Both, yeah. both pride and fear yeah. can be driven out by love. And, and it's only what kind of love? The godly. love that God provides. Godly love. It's godly Nothing. love. Yeah. And so if you don't have a true picture of God, what he's like, then we're in trouble, right? Yeah. That is so much in trouble. He understood, Connie, that the greater weapon is love. Yeah. That's right. You know, I, 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 yeah. 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 yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because, I mean, what, how do we defeat, how did Christ defeat people that were opposed to him? Or, or you know, when I say people, did Christ ever pick out anybody by name and condemn, condemn them? No. No. He never. never. Remember, like even in today, there's a passage in today's lesson where he's looking at the scribe, the Pharisees, a group of Pharisees and scribes or whatever, Sadducees, and he didn't call them out by name. 
And you know, there were probably those amongst them that weren't, that it didn't apply to. What he said didn't apply to them. So I mean, how, as an example, how do Christians fight, I should say, or maybe, I don't know, maybe not fight, but what's a better word? How, how, how do we defeat? In, yeah. Engage in spiritual well, warfare? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's right. I mean, it's principles, right? So it's principles. So if we see the principle of power over where we're dominating, he told his disciples, my kingdom is not like that. You know what I mean? My kingdom is so service, you know what I mean? And humble service to others. Our kingdom is not like that. And so when we see that principle, we have to know that that's something we have to stand up against. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be directed at an individual because really it's somebody that's a puppet in the background. I mean, we're looking at a puppet for somebody that's pulling the strings in the background. Yeah, I mean, just, just to put it in a couple of words, you know, I mean, I th Christians should... We, we fight against ideas. And the way to defeat wrong ideas is with the truth. But if we don't know the truth ourselves in the first place, see, that's the... But, I mean, does that, does that mean that, well, I'm not sure I know the whole truth, so maybe I shouldn't say anything? Well, I'm glad you. I'm glad you brought that up. You know, I oh. I, I personally um, I like what Ben Carson said. I saw on, on Facebook on that basically. Um, it's about forgiveness. You can't have all this stuff and forgiveness <clears throat> and forgiveness at the same time. It doesn't fit. So the only I mean forgiveness is the only answer, and forgiveness is based on love. And the other, you're absolutely right, but um, forgiveness actually is the only thing that will bring healing to and solve the problem. But um, you can't force forgiveness either. And that's, that's, the, that's the part where a lot of people have wrong. They think if we're in the right, then we can make people right too. Right? Is that not the history of the ills of this world in Christianity is we're in the right. We believe we're in the right because God has given us power. Therefore, we can make everybody else right with us. And if they're not, well, they don't matter. Well, you know, Paul says the truth in love. That's what he writes in the New Testament. If, if the truth is not connected with love, now that doesn't mean it's not going to offend anybody. It can still be given with love and offend somebody. I mean, we're, you know, and it's not, it's not right just to keep quiet because you think it might, have, it might offend somebody. It depends on the situation. You have to pray and ask God to impress on you what to do, you know, at that certain time. But, you know, when I think of a, an outfit, a secular outfit, that depends on unity and cohesion and brotherhood, I think of the military. Yeah. And if you wanted to destroy the military, how would you do it? Critical race theory. There you go. Yeah. Critical race. Critical theory. race theory. I mean, yeah. that, that that's a way to destroy the military. That that also could destroy our church. Yeah. You know, yeah. the bonds that should become because. Let me let's just give you a, a short rundown here. You know, I don't know if you know, but. Um, back about 1960, you know, finally the Marxist professors in this country. Could see they they despaired of ever having the Marxist revolution come about the way Marx said because you know he, he forecast a class struggle between the oppressed workers and the owners and that, that, that was not going to happen you know in Western Europe or America because the workers were upwardly mobile and, and you know they weren't bad enough off yeah. well any, anyway so what happened was they transferred the struggle to race and they substituted race for class you know and that's what this that's what that's what's behind this I mean that 
there, there's a there's a socialist or communist revolution coming coming. That's what they hope. The people that started this, yeah. you know. And I mean, it, it's just it's an awful thing. But I mean, look, I'm thinking back of, of a lot of these conflicts that happen in the world, with the Sarajevo and all these others. They start with something else, and they boil into a um, a race war. I mean. Even in South Africa, they're saying well, right now what's happening. I mean, apparently the Indians the, from India are being severely attacked, and there's a, there's a huge race component that is it is boiling in all of this. We've got the Asians here in America. But it, it's and it's everywhere. And, and I mean, Satan is twisting the hearts of everyone to hate each other. Well, listen. We, he, we, he knows more than any one of us that his time is short. He yeah. knows that. Yeah. And so this is the roaring lion thing. He's, he's every soul he can he can get to come to him. He will. Well, it shouldn't be surprising that that's a core way that he's getting at people, being that looking at the history of it. I mean, did this not start all the way back with Cain and Abel? When Cain left, and the mark was put on him, and he was afraid, and, uh, uh, you know, um, we don't know what all that meant, but he looked different, and his families looked different, and they separated, and then, you know, there were wars, and then, you know, everyone became wicked, basically, and the flood had to come, and, you know, then, then, then Noah and his sons, and then it all started back over again, and uh, you had, uh, you know, you had this just in the hearts of men everywhere continually ever since then where somebody perceives himself better than somebody else and they see themselves as a group because of some you know ethnic or physical difference and uh, they identify with each other and then we're better than you or vice versa and boom, we're more righteous than you are more righteous and whatever it is and hard feelings bitterness like we were talking about builds over time between all of this so like the scripture says as it was in the days of noah yeah so shall it be in the coming of the son of man i i try to imagine you know just from scripture and from spirit of prophecy reading and and what was it like in the in the days of noah well the, the, the scripture says their thoughts were only evil continually in other words <laughs> It just only evil continually. That means they never thought about good things. Which means that everyone was explicitly selfish. So, exactly. Exactly. And therefore, nobody could trust each other at all. That's what it does, doesn't it? Destroys yeah. trust. Let me, let me ask you guys this. I mean, do we prove that we're Christians here in, at Douglasville if we get up out of Sabbath school, everybody agreeing with exactly with everybody else? <laughs> it feels good though, doesn't it? <laughs> as long as you agree with church. me. Yeah, that, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. No, is, that, is that the feel good gospel? Is that what that is? No. But I mean, I mean, Christian unity does not depend on ag agreeing exactly. But that, I think what it depends on is even if we might disagree some, that we're all still friends. That's a good point, Harry. Well, isn't and how, that? And how true that is, isn't it? Really. Well, isn't that the only time that you can have love or forgiveness is when there's disagreement? Well, but yeah. All the that, rest of the time, it's... it's that involves all the, forgiveness. Well, I mean, the Bible talks about that even the wicked men, when they agree with each other, get along. Sure, yeah. It's only at the point to where we don't see things the same, the true love or forgiveness actually manifests itself. That's a good point. Yeah. Let me... Just move on a little bit from this, but um, how many of you honor your parents because it's a legal requirement or because you're afraid not to? When they're under 18. Do I? The, the kids that are under 18. Because <laughs> at, at that point, some actually do because their parents tell them to. But once you get over that age, you're emancipated. Yeah. I mean, if, if a person hates their parents in their heart, or even or one parent in their heart, but on the surface acts like 
everything's fine, everything's great, I love you, and all this other kind of stuff, what does that, what does that do to the person inside that acts that way? It puts them in a turmoil. Yeah. Because there are so many abused children yeah. and that become adults that still have an ounce of love for their parents. Yeah. I don't know if it's respect, I don't yeah. know if it's love, yeah. but yeah. they still have this feeling of something for their parents that the they just can't get rid of. God there, puts there it there, kind of. something there, yes. Yeah. And, and there's something there that they just can't quite get rid of. They still respect, they still want to go back, they still want, there's still something there. And it really puts them in, in, in this, this quandary, this, this turmoil in their minds that they really have a hard time dealing with. But, I mean, isn't this the problem that the Bible talks about the sins will go to the third and fourth generation? Because people treat each other this way and it takes at least that long to break that cycle where you're you, you're drawn to that, but then you're mistreated, so you don't know how to deal with it, and they end up, you end up doing the same thing. No, they may not treat their kids like that, but but it's that relationship aspect of I I really hate my mom, or my son-in-laws have has this problem, I really can't stand her, but he finally managed to break it off totally with her, but it took him years to do that after what she did to him um, throughout the years. But, you know, it, it just really tormented him. But what I'm saying, unfortunately, even though we go, some people go through stuff like this, a lot of them repeat the same behavior that they did because that, that's in a way, it's, in a way that's all they know and in a way that seemed like it was normal to them. Yeah. I mean, everything seems normal until you see something that, I mean, when, even when you're not, until you see something that actually is normal to compare it to. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. What, what is God's primary concern for us, for each one of us? Salvation. Yeah, to be with him. Salvation, yeah. yeah. Healing from the damage that sin, sin has done to us, you know? I mean, Jesus showed it, period. He wants us to have peace, happiness, love, and eternal life. And he starts it, in, I believe, in somewhat that order because he came and he healed first. He opened their minds and heart. He gave them that peace and happiness and opened up the ability for them to decide to love him. You know, he didn't force them. And I don't believe everyone he healed actually followed him. We see that with the ten lepers. Ten took off. One came back. The other nine, eh, you know, they're happy they were healed. But they, uh, at that moment, didn't seem to care about who did it. Yeah. What, what about, I mean, isn't, isn't God primarily concerned with our character? Because, I mean, isn't that the one thing we take to heaven with us? Yeah, yeah. And, if, and if our characters are so important, isn't God's character very important? Because we, we need to know who to emulate, right? Right. If we have the wrong view of God's character, we can't let him reproduce his in us. Yeah. Well, and with the wrong character, these things I mentioned, the peace, happiness, love, and all that stuff, they are not sustained. They won't last. See, you, you might have it momentarily, yeah. but without the transforming power of God to change our character, these things won't last, and we can't have eternal life. See, you know, it, it says in a... I think it's Ephesians, the first chapter, you know, that we are God's poetry. We are God's masterpiece. <clears throat> if we are God's poetry or his masterpiece, that means we are somebody. Each one of us is somebody. Yeah. Not because of the name that's on the back of our jeans or the kind of car that we drive or the house that we live in or the size of our bank accounts. We are somebody because we are important to God. Amen. Amen. And, and we ought to treat each other that way. That's right. Too. And, and think about it. I don't, I don't care how unlikable a person might be. That person is important to Almighty God. Yes. And should be important to us. Yeah. Right? At the same time. Yeah. Can a person really love another person? 
if they don't have godly kind of the godly kind of love. It's difficult, isn't it? Well, yeah, yeah. Not only is it uh, not only is it difficult, uh, Harry, but I think uh, to love them in the right way, in a godly way, yeah, uh, is is impossible. I don't think it can happen. Yeah. Uh, well, it'll seem so until something tries it. Yeah. Yeah, right. <clears throat> and that trial may be just an irritation. <laughs> is, is there any sin that's not selfish? We started, talking, we started out talking about selfishness, you know. Yeah, there's, there, there's no sin that is not selfish, you know. No. Yeah. Well, because, because it, sin is wrapped up in the opposite of either loving God or loving your neighbor. That's, that, that is the... Those two combined, Jesus said, is, is the um, opposite of sin, right? Yeah. So anything, so to break either one of those, you have to turn inward instead of outward, right? Yeah. Here, let me share with you this Ellen White quote. It says, all sin is selfishness. Satan's first sin was a manifestation of selfishness. He sought to grasp power to exalt self. A species of insanity led him to seek to supersede God. And the temptation that led Adam to sin was Satan's declaration that it was possible for man to obtain something more than he'd already enjoyed. The sowing of seeds of selfishness in the human heart was the first result of the entrance of sin into the world. God desires everyone to understand the evil of selfishness and goes on. It's, it's a worthwhile passage to read. It's in Where's it from? Um, September 9, 1902, paragraph 3, Workers' Bulletin. Huh. A magazine article. But, but think about this. All selfishness is a lie. Yeah. Is it not? Satan's the father of lies. It's a misrepresentation. Yeah. Well, everything that he says that we will gain if we do these things is a lie. Because we will gain nothing out of selfishness, will we? We will not get better. We will not get happier. We will not become more like God. Everything we perceive we will get out of selfishness is a lie because it will never happen. Oh, yes, it will, but not long term. Oh, oh. Yes, That's it, what I was yes. just wondering about. Well, it, it, it does, it, but it's not a long term and it's not a peaceful, it's not a... a that's um, still a lie then. No, uh, but it, that, that's a technicality because people don't think long term. They no. think... They think short term, what can I get out of it right now? So, yeah, it, they'll, that's where he's got people. See, well, it did happen, didn't it? Just not as long as you wanted. Yeah. So, yeah, See, he, yeah. See, I told you you wouldn't die. Yeah. Right then. <laughs> yeah. Right then. Yeah. Well, uh, but that's still part of the lie because with, with God, everything is eternal and true. And, and, tr people, and truth is eternal. But people don't think on those terms because no. they're... I want it now, give it to me now, yeah. type people. Yeah, you're right. So there. they see it and they think, oh, well, I got it. You know, my that concert was really fun for now, and so when's the next one? Yeah. 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 You know, in, in the lesson, you know, in Luke 12, it says, someone in the, talking to Jesus, says, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you. Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in abundance of possessions. This man wanted a ruling from Jesus, right? What kind of law requires a judge to make a ruling? Human law. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's human law, right? Man-made law that requires a judge to make a ruling, you know? And what, and what kind of law is property law? I mean, it's made-up human law. That's right. right. Yeah. And, and Jesus said he was, I'm not appointed as a judge. He didn't come to administer law and to make legal rulings. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he, because he came not to to divide, but to bring together. <laughs> and what happens when that, when the, when the, when usually when a decision is handed down like that, 
There is division, right? Well, and, and Jesus' purpose wasn't temporary. These human laws are all temporary. His purpose was to come and get the lost sheep and bring them home. And, and, and see, these are, all, these are all true. And I mean, you think about why did Christ really come to this earth, you know? I mean, he didn't come to make legal rulings, you know, to make legal pronouncements. He came to con change the conditions of people's hearts. Yes, he was a demonstration project. Yes. He, his demonstration would change their hearts, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean. Well, I mean, it goes back to Genesis 3.15. It was all about the controversy between the serpent and Jesus and settling the truth between them. I mean, that's the real issue, is it not? And when he hung on that cross, the lies were revealed and the truth was revealed. None of it was murky anymore. None of it was theoretical anymore. And that's why the angels, even at that point, some may have been sympathetic with Satan before that. They weren't any longer. The theory, the theoretical, the, the doubts, everything was settled. Yeah. Settled. And that was his purpose. Yeah. And, and that settling of that is what changes the hearts of those that look at it. You know, you think, you think about what do people in this world focus on? Our rights, my rights, you know, my privileges, you know, my inheritance, you know, here on this earth. We want a ruling by somebody in authority like a judge or maybe a CDC official, you know, or something like that, a ruling in our favor. Christ didn't come to settle those kind of issues. Well, I think of Lot's wife. We think she's looking back at the city. Maybe she was, but maybe she was looking back more at the things that she owned that she was walking away from. Maybe the family, her children, whatever it was. I don't think it was the rest of the city. I think it was her stuff that she didn't want to leave. I mean, we have that problem, don't we? We don't want to walk away from our stuff. Yeah. And that's why Jesus says it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom. But, but you think, if you think about it, there is a judge in Christianity, you know, and I'm not, I'm not thinking about either um, God the Father or, or even Jesus or the Holy Spirit, any of the Godhead. And I th think in, in one sense, there is a judge, and that is the word of God right yeah, here. Right, exactly. In, right here. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, the very word, the truth, yeah. reality. Reality itself, you know, sheep are sheep, goats are goats, weed is wheat, weeds are weeds, and a judge doesn't make a sheep a sheep. Right? Yeah, that's right. They are what they are. Yeah. Reality is the judge. Yeah. You know? A good point, Harry. And what happens to those who reject the words of Jesus? He will reject them. Well, like Sadly. everything, else, like everything in the world, in the end, we will get what we wanted. If we want eternal life in Jesus, we will get that because we will accept it. Those that didn't want it won't get it. Yeah, you know, I mean, Christ. You know, it, it tells us in the New Testament kind of what what will happen to people that don't accept Christ, and He lets them go. What else can He do? Their, their characters are not fit for heaven. They, they would not be, even be happy, Ellen White tells us, living there. You know? I mean, and, and I think as the lost are being consumed outside the city in the end, Jesus and God will be crying. You know? Just like many of us. As a matter of fact, <coughs> I think if we're not crying to see what's happening to our loved ones and other people's loved ones, we won't be there in the first place. Yeah. Well, and, and maybe it was Ty Gibson, I think, or, or somebody like that, was talking about, and I never saw this before in this perspective, those that are outside the city that initially start, we're told, rushing towards the city, 
Yeah. He doesn't believe that's why God consumes it. Their selfishness and all that we were talking about here, they start turning on each other, on who gets there first and, you know, all this stuff. And it, it melts into absolute chaos where they're fighting and destroying each other. Um, and they lose sight of it. And God brings down that fire to stop the suffering that they're bringing on each other. You know, it's not a vengeance like a lot of people think it is. And that's why I believe you're absolutely right. He will shed many tears in doing this. But it just goes to show the very last act all of these people do will be Mm self-centered in chaos. And and, and there's no other option to stop it, right? But yet to put an end to it. Yeah, I know it's a sad, it's an awfully sad thing, you know. So, something else, just to skip over before we close. And let's, hey, one of you guys, Robert, would you? When I need to give me about three or four minutes to close, to close. You know? I think you got three minutes right now. Okay. Um, you know, there's something that I hadn't gone over before, but in in this lesson, I think um, people today talk a lot about equality. Yeah. Uh-uh. As a matter of fact, it was part of the slogan of the French Revolution, you know, liberty, brotherhood, equality, you know? And when they think about equality, what they're really thinking about is equity. And, you know, equity is the application of external power to arbitrarily force outcomes to a certain result. This, regardless you know, of the reality, ability, or achievement. Equity is not equality. Equity is the catchphrase of, of the jealous, those who are warning, warring against the principles of God's kingdom. God is not about equity. He's about equality. You'll, you'll, never, you'll never have peace on this earth or unity if you try to force the same outcome on everybody, if you try to force outcomes. Different people, you know, put in different amounts of effort. Different people have different talents, you know. And, and God is the judge. Yeah, it's like, like a friend of mine. He, he, well, he, that, that's the same story of the parable that all the workers came at different times of the day. They were all happy to get a day's wages until it was over and they were getting paid. And one guy's like, hey, he's getting paid the same as me and he only worked an hour. You know, and then everybody's mad about what they got because they think they should have more when they were all happy with it when they started. Yeah. Isn't, that, isn't that the same thing you were talking about? Um, and God in this is given the wages, which are fair and just, but then nobody's happy with them in the end because of they, they got nearsighted and started comparing themselves to each other. And I want more i want more that's not fair i don't like this you know um thomas aquinas is really the the most the preeminent and just about only sole philosopher of the catholic church and he he has written that it is okay for a per for a person that doesn't have something to go over and take it from his neighbor who has I mean, to take it by force. This, this is foundational philosophy built into the Catholic Church. You know, when you hear people say certain things, it's good to know where they're coming from. You know? God, there cannot be equitable outcomes with unequal actions by people. There cannot be. The only thing is that happens usually, like in a socialist state, is that there's equal misery. Yeah. Yeah, right. That's what it comes down: equal poverty, equal misery. Yeah. That that's what that's what happens in the end, you know. And that's what I can't understand. I mean, there's been over there's been over a hundred million people killed this last century under socialist dictatorships, and yet people still want it. They they want this kind of government. They want this kind of philosophy, you know. And what it does is it, it puts a few people, a few politicians, 
And the politicians, 95% of them who are, who are into socialism, are in it for the money. I mean, it puts them on top and them in power. And then it puts a lot of, no middle, wipes out the middle class and puts just a bunch, bunch of poor people scratching for a living and barely getting by. I mean, you see it now in Cuba with the people rising up. Well, it's all based on promises that never happen. Right? Yes. Because That's what they do. They promise because the end. politicians never follow through with the promises of, you know, giving everybody what they deserve. Yeah, you know, I, th I think that th this, is, this is really, we don't discuss a lot of these things very often. And this is a good time to take stock of ourselves and study. And you don't just have you don't just have to you know you can you can read when you read what somebody else says or, or what, what you hear on the news. The first question you ask yourself: Where's that coming from? What's this person's background? Is the, is this a godly principle, you know, or is this a selfish principle? Will this principle lead to unity of people, or will this lead to disorder, you know, to chaos? Anyway. If we are unified in our love for each other, and that doesn't mean that we all completely agree with each other, right. but it does mean that we're all friends. Amen. You know? Amen. If we are all friends, I think it, that's a de that demonstrates that God is with us. You know? Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come here and study your word. Father, be with our country in these times. Be with our leaders. Impress on them the right thing to do, Lord, and be with our people. Help us to do the right thing and help us, help us to demonstrate to people that we are on your side and, and that we believe in you. Father, save each one here. Reunite us all in heaven when you come. In Christ's name we ask it for his sake. Amen.